So like Carol mentioned, my name is Michelle Winters. Um, I am the executive director of um, the Alliance for Housing Solutions. And I'm not the only one from AHS here. We have a few of our board members, uh, former State Senator Mary Margaret Whipple, there in the front is the chair of our board. We have Dave Liebson, who is the president of our board. Um, and I can't see any other folks. Okay, the president and the chair, that's pretty good. Um, so thank you guys for coming. So what is AHS? We are a nonprofit organization um, in Arlington uh, that focuses on increasing the supply of affordable housing in both Arlington and Northern Virginia um, through public education, uh, policy development, advocacy, and innovation. And so you didn't hear the one word in there called development. Uh, so that's basically what we don't do. We don't develop housing, but we uh, try to make it uh, better and easier um, and more smooth and more, make more sense about how we develop more affordable housing um, here in Arlington. Um, we run a campaign called Arlington for Everyone, which you see signs and buttons and, and stickers here. We hope you, you join us in this campaign. Um, this is basically uh, our, it's, it's our main public education and outreach effort um, where we're talking about how we can make Arlington a place where people from all walks of life are welcome and can afford to live. So there's three components of that campaign. Um, that we recognize that we want Arlington to be a place for everyone, where people from all walks of life are welcomed uh, to live and fully participate. We think Arlington's a greater place because of its openness to diversity and inclusion. And then we think that creating and maintaining a variety of housing options in Arlington is essential to this diversity. So, big question that everybody always asks. What is affordable? What are you talking about? <laughs> Um, we know that the word affordable wasn't necessarily in the headline for this event, but it's a key uh, term and a key, something that we have to understand. So housing affordability and affordable housing, they, are, they all revolve around whether the payment for a home or an apartment um, is reasonable for that person at their income level. So the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development defines affordable housing as decent quality housing that costs no more than 30% of a household's gross monthly income for rent, mortgage, and utility payments. So uh, that means that affordability and affordable housing applies to people of all income levels. It's not just a, a low income thing. Um, it's a, it's an, a concept that applies to everybody. And why does affordab affordability matter for a community like Arlington? Um, we think that uh, it, it primarily helps in keeping Arlington and all of its neighborhoods, if done right, are diverse, um, economically, culturally, and demographically. It helps support and sustain economic development by helping employers attract and retain workers and keeping Arlington, the Arlington economy resilient. We'll be hearing from some of those employers uh, later on. It helps reduce commuting, um, both in costs and time and impact on the environment. And it reduces turnover in schools, which is good for students, the families and Arlington schools. So here today we are talking about middle income. And so I wanted to start off by showing you uh, the range of incomes and, and to also just point out something very important, um, which is although we are talking about affordable housing and housing for middle income people, AHS and many housing related organizations ar around the country and locally, we tend to focus on lower income people when it comes to affordability. And so I wanted to show you this chart. This shows you the number of people across the US in thousands um, that are either severely cost burdened, which is paying more than 50% of their income for housing, or just plain old cost burdened, paying more than 30%. So in other words, not meeting that definition of affordable, no matter what their income is. And as you can see, and this is organized by AMI. So that means area median income. So the smaller numbers are zero to 30% of area median income. And then all the way up to the box being around the group that we're talking about today. So nationwide, you can see that the vast majority of the housing needs when it comes to cost burden are in the lower income groups. And we focus on those quite a bit. Uh, that is the majority of the work that AHS does and it's where the majority of the programs um, go. I'll show you what some of those numbers are. So to, to lay it out a little bit more clear, what is 
this percent of AMI. So that the AMI in the Washington DC area that applies to Arlington right now is uh, 82,000 for a for a, per, a, a one family household and 117,000 for a four person household. And so this chart shows you how that spreads out down to the 60% and below um, is below 49,000 or below 70,000 all the way up to the 120% of AMI and above which is at around 100,000 and 141,000. So it's a wide range. This chart I also wanted to show you um, how the typical programs that, that deal with housing affordability are broken down by that in income spectrum. So the gray box on the side, on, on the left hand side, under the 60% and 60 to 80% of AMI, that's where we focus most of our rental housing assistance. So the federal government, Arlington County, the state, money that goes into helping people with affordable housing needs goes primarily into that side of things. On the, in the green box, um, when you're talking about 80% of AMI and above, most of the pro federal government, local government, all of the assistance focused on this income bucket is primarily home ownership assistance. With the top one being, as you guys have all probably heard, the mortgage interest deduction, um, which is kind of a, a hidden subsidy that goes to home ownership and it's predominantly an upper income uh, subsidy. But we also have other programs. You'll be hearing a lot about these from Karen, the ones that are local that help people get into homes at various income levels. And then the other program that kind of cuts across all of these income levels is the responsibility of local government and that is zoning. And zoning controls what is our density, so how many units we can build, the dimensions of what we can build, the setbacks, the types of uses, and the locations of what we can build. We're gonna be talking a lot about that today as well because that's one of the primary tools that we have to impact affordability at the moderate and, and, and higher income levels. So, how do all those incomes show up here in Arlington? So this median income level that we talk about, that, that level is determined for the whole metro area. So in Arlington, who, who lives here? Um, this chart shows that we, what we, you know, from an income perspective, call the, the missing middle. Um, we have a lot of wealthy people in Arlington. That's the bar, the two bars on the right. They rent here and they own here. Um, we have, at least at the time this chart was made, the data is old because the census only happens every, you know, every 10 years, we had, at one point, a fairly large number of low-income renters. We know that that number has dropped because we have had a huge decline um, in the number of, of apartments affordable, the market rate apartments affordable to that income level. So we've lost 18,000 of those units since 2000. Um, so we know that that's huge. But even when these numbers were done, you can see that, that even from both a renter and an owner perspective, there's really kind of a dearth of people in Arlington down here um, in the middle income levels. And why might that be? Well, here's the housing market in Arlington. Um, we have, uh, so the top section is detached housing, the middle section is attached housing, and the bottom section is condos. The average uh, housing uh, sales prices in Arlington for the year 2017 for single family homes of either three or four bedrooms, either detached or attached, at the four bedroom level over a million dollars. Three bedroom, you know, you're, you're in the 700 um, thousand range. But even for attached, even for townhomes, if you're going into a three bedroom space, you're over $700,000 on average. The, the pink box is approximately where that range of 80 to 100 percent of median could potentially afford. And you can see that the only categories of things that fall into that box are condos, which are predominantly one and two bedroom, and two bedroom townhomes, and two bedroom detached homes. And by the way, my new term for those two bedroom detached homes is dinosaurs. They're going extinct. They will not be here. The next time we do this, you know, these numbers, they'll be gone. Um, they, as you know, they're being snatched up, they're being <coughs> renovated, well, probably not renovated, they're being leveled and replaced with the four plus bedroom ones that are going for one and a half million dollars. So we know that's happening. Now here's a, another way to see it. So this chart shows you 
across the dollars that people spend on housing, again, this is 2017 home sales in Arlington. The gray is condo, the blue is single family homes, and the attached are, are there in the orange in, in between. So condos, we actually have a large number of condos here in Arlington and a large number of those are sold every year. Those are being bought by people who are able to live in a predominantly one or two bedroom living arrangement. As, they are, as people who are living in the one and two bedroom living arrangement want to move up to perhaps a townhome or perhaps a home that might have something more than two bedrooms, there's, there's, I'm going to use a little, look at how this, look at this. We have a, smaller condos, a gap, and then big single family homes. So you can see it, this is just another way of looking at the data. It's really interesting. I actually had to double check this data because it was like, did it really show me the gap that I was going to be talking about? And it did. <laughs> so this is really interesting. Um, now, why does this happen? Well, um, we talked about zoning. Zoning is the thing that determines what kinds of housing we have in our community. That didn't used to be the case because zoning is a relatively new phenomenon. It was created and, and spread throughout the country in the 20th century. So before zoning came around, Arlington had lots of its communities built just based on what the developers wanted to build. They wanted to build single family homes for the most part, or as you all know, a lot of, Mar of Arlington was built for war housing. So we have a lot of uh, increasingly dinosaur-like, um, uh, uh, what was the word on the garden apartments, um, that are also um, being replaced. But when zoning came around in the early first half of the 20th century, I can't remember the exact date, those zoning maps drew lines around what was there and said, and, and this is my interpretation, basically said, what's here is the only thing that's going to be allowed here in the future. Now, we had been able to really update that. We did a huge update of our general land use plan and our zoning ordinance in the 60s and 70s with, the, with um, our metro corridor strategy. So we really modernized our metro corridor but we haven't really modernized what's going on outside of the metro corridor and as a result we have a lot of zoning that says single family only and single family on large lots only and th that's the type of zoning that produces larger and larger homes because as people buy those dinosaurs those two bedrooms that that remain they are replacing them because they can and because the zoning says that's the only thing they can do they can only build a single family home on that lot. So people started talking about this all over the country. It's not just in Arlington. And somebody named Daniel Perolik, an architect from California, um, he coined this term missing middle. So while I gave the introduction as missing middle people and households, this refers to missing middle housing. So in other words, missing middle housing types. And he looked around and he said, you know, what happened in communities is We've got a decent number, well, we've got a large number of single family homes. Lots of America is carved up into single family lots. And we have some areas that we've decided is okay for density. And so we've started building multifamily housing there. We've started um, having metro systems there, and that's great. But what we've got is something in the middle that doesn't really happen. So, you know, so what he's talking about is. Well, what happens, whoops, I'm sorry. You know, what happened to the triplexes and fourplexes? He calls townhouses missing. I don't call them missing in Arlington because I just call them squished single family homes. <laughs> um, multiplexes, live work buildings, a lot of the pictures that you saw on the way in, that's what he's calling missing middle housing. So we heard about this a couple of years ago. AHS, we ran a big program in uh, 2016. We brought uh, Daniel Parolik in to talk to us, and we also looked at some of our own data to see, well, you know, how do we do in this, in this missing middle, middle housing type thing? Sorry, wrong way. And lo and behold, this is Arlington. You see something? You see a pattern? So Arlington has, let me see, one unit detached owners, 
a few one unit attached owners, lots of renters in large multifamily buildings, decent number of condos in large multifamily buildings, and almost nothing in between. So we are a really good example of this missing middle, middle, missing middle housing phenomenon. And so we started talking um, back then, we started talking with the county, we started talking with the community about what is it that we can do to help encourage more of something in the middle. Um, and so let me talk to you a little bit more about what the missing middle housing is. First of all, those missing middle housing types are very neighborhood scale. Um, they would fit very well within that single family context. They tend to help produce a walkable neighborhood. The building footprints are small, so a fourplex looks like a single family home, um, but there's four units in it. A duplex looks like a single family home, but there's two units in it. The footprints are small, they, they, they have yards, it's walkable, community friendly. They are higher density if you count up the number of units, but you don't think that when you see them. So that's called lower perceived density. Uh, the units are smaller and well designed. They're not the 5,000 square foot homes. There may be a 1,200 square foot condo, not you know, in, in those four units, or those four units could be rental two, or one, one person could own them and rent out the other three. There's all different ways it could be done. Um, there's fewer off-street parking spaces. They tend to be simple construction, so they're not gonna be concrete, expensive buildings with elevators, and there's not gonna be a doorman, and there's not gonna be a pool on the roof. Um, so when we create them, like in that, that I'm describing the luxury um, condos that we're, that, or apartments often that we're seeing now, um, but they're not gonna be that typically if we build them in the way that we are talking about building them. Um, some of the benefits of doing them, so we're talking about, uh, we talk a lot about neighborhood character in Arlington. This is the kind of housing development that can help preserve neighborhood character by blending in with the scale of single family, existing single family housing. They're easily mistaken for single family homes. They serve as a visual transition between an, a single family neighborhood and say a commercial node or, or a district. And if I skip right to the bottom on that, they help make those commercial nodes and districts more possible because those commercial nodes, a Starbucks that everybody wants, it's not gonna happen unless you have enough people in the surrounding district to walk to it um, or even a short drive. There's, they're not gonna happen unless you have enough people to support that neighborhood retail. And so this, this sort of lower perceived density, these units help create enough demand for some of that neighborhood retail that people like. Um, it helps create a variety of types and locations, both for rental and more affordable home ownership opportunities. So we could have more diverse neighborhoods. This is a really important issue here in Arlington. Um, if any of you have been paying attention to what's going on in our schools, we have an incredibly segregated school system. And people are talking about, well, why can't we do the boundaries so that we can have a more diverse school? Well, that's one approach. But the reason that our schools are segregated is because our neighborhoods are segregated. And so the real way to solve that problem, and it'll take a long time, but the real way to solve that problem is to diversify our neighborhoods. And this kind of housing is one very good way to achieve that. And then of course, it provides housing options for different household types, such as smaller families, empty nesters, People who have lived in those single family homes but don't necessarily want to leave the neighborhood could potentially be living in these smaller units if we allowed them. Now, are they affordable? Well, that's a really good question. Um, the way that we talk about things that are done through zoning, there are some tools to require and incentivize some of the units to remain affordable uh, to certain income levels. But for the most part, we're talking about something that's going to happen in the market. Um, and how do you get something that happens in the market to be more affordable? Well, we think this is kind of one of those naturally affordable by design situations. Smaller unit sizes, more modest amenities, like I said, no, no doorman, no pool on the roof. It's the potential to keep prices and rents down naturally. And then that potentially can create more feasible options for middle income buyers and renters. Now it's not a given. The way, again, we're creating zoning, the builders build with, you know, according to the zoning, they could create luxury units, 
we can talk about what we could potentially do to try to keep them um, to be more reasonably priced units. So what does it look like? You guys saw the, uh, on the pathway on the way in, um, we did something called a request for examples. We needed help. Uh, we wanted to see what these units looked like, so we reached out to designers and, and owners all around the country, actually, and found some examples. Uh, we wanted to see some buildable types. So you see some, some building plans here. Here's a, a new type for a new duplex. Sorry, keep doing it. This duplex looks kind of like my house, but there's two people, you know, two families living there. Um, we actually have something that is called semi-detached in Arlington that looks kind of like two townhomes sitting next to each other. Those aren't actually duplexes. A duplex usually only has one front door. Um, this actually, this, this design, this is a, a technicality of Arlington zoning. We call them semi-detached. Duplexes have one front door and then it diverges from there. Either two, one on the top and one on the bottom or two next to each other. Another really interesting example is a fourplex. This fourplex is four three-bedroom units in one single-family home that kind of looks like the same size home that they're building in some of these knockdowns when they take the t when they take the ten, the twelve thousand you know the twelve hundred square foot home down and they replace it with five or six. Well, what if you actually had more than one family living in there because there's room for them. Um, and we know that it's possible. We have examples of where it's being done. So that was one of the main points of us doing this, was that we wanted examples. In this case, this is, these are three bedroom units. There's examples if we want them smaller. Um, this is an example of one bedrooms in a, in a fourplex. It's a little bit smaller, more petite um, profile, but it can be done as well. There's examples of eight unit, they're called eight plexes. Well, we, when we found these, we thought, oh, that's so charming. And then I realized why it's so charming, because it's exactly what we're knocking down in Westover. <laughs> Westover units are eight unit buildings. These could potentially be developed if we could encourage them, if we could allow them, if we could figure out what all the zoning recipe is to get them to come back. Um, it's not super straightforward, but we can talk about that soon with Eric. Um, and then this is an example Again, there's a spectrum of small multifamily housing types. This is a small multifamily, not of the type that you would typically see in a high density corridor. This actually is in Arlington. It's located on 9th Street, I'm sorry, 9th Road. It's called the Hyde. Um, it's an 18 unit building. That is very small for an apartment building being built these days. One of the trends that we've seen overall is that massive increase in the average size of multifamily buildings just going up and up and up. Um, mostly because, you know why that's happening? Because the only places they're being approved is in places that are already high density. Because people are, there's a, the NIMBY phenomenon is keeping smaller multifamily out of their neighborhoods. And so if we allowed them in the neighborhoods, that they could potentially be building smaller ones. Another interesting type is pocket neighborhoods. These are clusters of little single family cottages, it's much smaller than what what even we have currently in Arlington. Clustered around typically a garden with parking on the side. We don't allow this in Arlington, but Falls Church does. They just uh, created a new ordinance last year uh, to start these, but these would be super charming. You think of some of the extra parking lots or you know areas that could potentially be redeveloped in Arlington, and it doesn't take a lot of space to do something like this, but our zoning needs to allow it first. Another one, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the idea of detached accessory dwelling units, which is also another tool to add affordability to our neighborhoods. It's, it adds affordability not only for the person who's going to be living in this little cottage in the backyard, it adds affordability for the person who owns the home to begin with and wants to build it. Um, if you have a senior who's, who owns a home and wants some help maybe with either living or just paying, paying their mortgage, putting a cottage in the backyard, renting it to a neighbor, I mean, to a, to a friend, to a teacher, to a police officer. Um, those kinds of things would be great, but sometimes the owner actually moves into it and then rents the home out uh, to somebody else. So this is another one. An again, this is not allowed in Arlington. It was voted down by the county board last December. It will come back next year. So this is an example of where we have some specific um, potential movements. So that's my part. 
Um, I will turn it over to Eric to talk about the realities <laughs> of some of this.